put a lot of work into putting this evening together, so we appreciate your being here. My name is Jed Garfield. I'm the current president of Leslie J. Garfield and Company. And um, we've been around since 1972, specializing in the sale of brownstone and townhouse property. One of the great things about having a boutique firm or being part of a boutique firm is that everyone in the office gets involved in everything. And that said, I just want to put out a special thanks to Sophie Smadbeck, who really did a tremendous amount of work, Mo Rengifo, and Tina McNerney. So thank you all very much. <laughs> In, in addition to that, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't specifically thank uh, Mark um, Winitsky from Bank of America. He's been both a friend and a sponsor for the last decade and has been an outstanding source of both advice and financing over the years. So thank you, Mark. We really do appreciate it. Well, just a brief... We, just a brief overview. So in terms of the townhouse market currently, um, when we were going over numbers this morning, I was surprised by a couple of things. Prices are actually up uh, throughout Manhattan, and that's not sort of a broker story. Statistically, prices are up. The average sale price increased up to $7.8 million from a little over $6 million last year. The average price per square foot is up to about $1,300 a foot. And unfortunately, the number of transactions is off roughly 35% year to date. Excuse me? Um, there have been several notable sales that have kept up prices. Uh, 1960 Fourth Street sold for $90 million uh, to Len Blavotnik. Len now owns close to two-thirds of the block between 63rd and 64th Street between 5th and Madison Avenue. Um, there was also a large sale Weinstein, the guy who was involved with the sexual harassment scandal, sold his house at 13 Bank Street for $25 million that closed maybe two weeks ago. And another good sign, 29 West 75th Street, um, sold for about $2,000 a square foot, just under $16 million not long ago. Um, m moving on, aside from the specifics, and we can cover this at the end, you know, as a salesman, some of my success is based on factors beyond my control. There's seller hopes and expectations, there's consumer confidence, and something I have no control over, which neighborhoods are hot and which are not. But the part that's not beyond my control is information. And when I'm speaking with someone I represent, or trying to get a piece of business, the conversation is rarely as simple as what's my property worth, although that's what everybody wants to know. But typically what people are really asking me is, what's my house worth? in the context of the world around me, which brings us to tonight's panel. It's my hope that in speaking to Rick and Fred and Paula, we can all have a slightly better understanding of what's going on in the market. Paula Rio is one of the top money managers at Goldman Sachs. She spends her days on the phone advising some of the world's wealthiest individuals on what they should be doing with their assets. Fred is the founder of Fargo Firm and Infacio, and he and his firm are accountants and advisors to millionaires, and perhaps some billionaires, although he isn't naming names. Fred spends his days advising some of the wealthiest on how to effectively run their businesses, and how to do so in the most tax-efficient way. And Rick, my partner of 15 years, is the top townhouse broker on the Upper West Side, bar none, statistically and otherwise. Rick has and always does advise clients in a forthright manner. The result may not always be specific.
specifically what someone wants to hear, but it's always accurate. And it's one of the things I love about it. So while the title of tonight's program is understanding the new tax laws and their impact, the subtitle for me is what's going on? Because I'm, I, I, I truly feel that way when I speak to owners and I speak to other people in the office. So to start off, Paula, just big picture, new presidency, is this like good or bad for your clients? Are they indifferent? How does this affect their bottom line? How does this affect your investment advice? Sure, and um, thank you for having me. This is, this is a real honor and a treat, and I look forward to, to meeting um, some of you later. But um, so new presidency, sort of politics, and once politics aside, I think there's two different lenses to look at, look at it in. Um, you know, new presidency, old presidency, whatever, we have an economy that is kind of moving along all the time. And the economy, as it turns out, had been in pretty good shape, the, the US economy, even going into this, into the election and into the new presidency. And that's often what drives, or really what drives the stock market and generally asset prices and certainly interest rates as well. So I don't think um, it's fair to say that any one president or any one administration really controls that because that's kind of happening you know, before their time. So we're in a good economy in the US and outside the US, and that's been good for asset values, right? The stock market was up 25% last year. I don't think anyone expected that, but you know, it's 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 holding, if not if not going up from there. But we at Goldman have a pretty favorable view of the US equity market this year, and more more so even outside the US because the global economy is also improving. So that's kind of the the good side of it in terms of asset values and what's supporting asset values. Um, that the economy really is, is a big part of it. Um, you know, the tax piece, that's sort of the, the elephant in the room. And how is that affecting people? It really depends on who you are. You know, a lot of our clients live in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, California. Obviously, if they're W-2 income earners, and even if they're not, they're getting affected by SALT, right, by the inability to deduct um, local and, and state taxes, and that's a negative. At the same time, if your stock portfolio is up 20%, you know, maybe you can kind of live with that a little better than, than if it weren't. So there's been some, you know, some positive elements even that we think SALT have brought, that we think tax people have brought to the table in terms of asset prices sure. that have helped. And then, you know, frankly, a lot of clients aren't as impacted by tax reform in a negative way the way many people in this room might be. Um, and some are very positively impacted. So offshore clients, non-US people, and there's a lot of those out there too, have a lot of incentive to bring money to the US now that they didn't have a year ago. And that's incredibly important, and we think it's going to be supportive of, of stock market values, probably of, of real estate as well, because it's a lot um, cheaper for people to repatriate money. So it's it's really different different answer depending on who you are. I, I mean, Paula, just to follow up on that. So foreign cash coming in, what sort of what are the benefits, and 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 do you see that in a large scale way? I mean, and are there any specific countries? where you're interacting with people were saying, yeah, the United States looks like a very good deal. Um, so there, the tax treatment of that, not to get sort of too in the weeds here, and, and whether it's oh, beneficial. I like the weeds. I like the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, too. Um, so it can be incredibly, incredibly tax beneficial, depending on, you're, you're probably in a better, better position than I am to answer why and how, but depending on what you are, if you're a corporation, if you're a flesh and blood person, and everything in between, you're going to have varying levels of benefit that you didn't otherwise have by bringing money into the U.S. So by and large, it's, it's a positive in, in terms of what it costs you to bring money into the U.S. Um, and as a, as a non-U.S. Um, entity or person. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, why do people do that? Well, look, everyone, and I think more so now in this era of sort of more geopolitical uncertainty, everyone likes the dollar. Choose to maybe buy real estate or buy stock or buy treasuries. I think at the end of the day, it's just a way to, to, to own dollars. I think that's how at least my clients think about it, who are investing across all these asset classes. And you know, if ever there was a time where the dollar felt like a smart bet, it's you know we think it's probably now with the U.S. economy outpacing most of the rest of the world, and again a geopolitical backdrop that's you know definitely not um, you know not tame. So, so from what you said, Paul, then it almost seems as though equities maybe are a better place to go because that market's doing so well versus asset classes like, like real estate. 
I think it, it, it totally depends. I mean, our, you know, by and large, our clients um, are, are you know, people that are already wealthy, and so they don't need to take giant risk in any one asset class. That being said, we have definitely folks who have made their fortunes and continue to make their fortune in real estate or in a single company or what have you, concentrated investment. But if you take some of those out just across the board, yes, you know, stocks, we still think are going to do well. And smart place to be if you're a taxpayer is even smarter but you know not to get too boring but you know municipal bonds uh, you know for people that are new york city taxpayers you know a couple years ago municipal bonds were yielding less than one percent now that same portfolio yields you over two and that's after tax more like four which means more now because all our taxes went up so that investment which didn't seem that interesting a couple years ago because rates have gone up because taxes have gone up is also more interesting. So it, it's nuanced. Yeah, and all right. I, I mean, I, I guess I guess anything related to taxes tends to be nuanced. I mean, Fred, what, what have you seen since? And, and has there been any significant change for clients of yours with the new presidency? Does, does it make a difference? And, and, and by the way, I was on the phone with Fred a couple of days ago asking him about this because I was just genuinely interested in, we all read, I, I, I want to hear his take on taxes, but I also want to hear his take on this notion of leaving a place like New York and moving to an alternative location. And whether that's Alaska or Wyoming, Florida, or where, wherever those places are in low tax states, I think that I mean, again, to me, I just think that's sort of an interesting place in terms of leaving New York. Why what, not? What's really happening is, for most people, the change in tax rates will be a couple percent of their income. And so there's a, there's a lot of complaining about it. But are you going to change your life for two or three percent of your income? Right. Do you really want to live in Florida? Do you really want to live in Alaska? So yes, people are looking at. By the way, do you have to, Fred? Do you actually have to move to Alaska? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. You, you do, the IRS will find you. It's, will it's not the IRS. It's the states that are very aggressive. Uh, I mean, I actually know one case where the state of New Jersey kept track of the tail number on somebody's plane and then tried to treat him as a resident of New Jersey. So how, how did that go? Uh, it was very expensive. <laughs> and, you know, the, they're very expensive, very invasive audits because this, you know, politically, it's the easiest thing in the world to go after somebody who's cheating the state or the city out of the taxes on their income. So it's more of a, it's, it's less of a federal issue and much more of a state. Much more of a state. Yes. Issue. Yes. And, and have there been any other, with the passage of the of the tax bill, have there been any other significant changes that people are like, Fred, what do I do now? Well, or, is, or, or it's really, it hasn't been it, It's It's a lot of understanding the new law. Right. And the law was, shall we say, <clears throat> not as well thought out as some past tax laws. Uh, so there are a lot of open questions. A lot of need for technical corrections acts, uh, need for explanation. And one of the big things that people are interested in is the so called pass through deduction, where if you're a qualified business, 20% of your income is excluded from tax. Uh -huh. But there's very, there are some things that are clear. It's clear that an accountant, a lawyer, doesn't qualify. Right. <laughs> it, it's not clear whether you on the your income from the company are qualified because some of it looks at the whether you are you you have a specialty and people are attracted to you. <laughs> so you know, um, trading income, things like that, none of it's defined. Gotcha. So there's a lot to come to. Right, it's a lot of questions. I mean, Rick, you're, you're dealing with this stuff on a daily <coughs> basis, as am I, as are all the brokers in the office. I mean, what kinds of things are owners saying to you, and what's your take? I mean, is this like a particularly good time to sell, a really bad time to sell? I mean, what do you, what, when, when you're on the phone with people, what, are, what kind of questions are they asking you, and how are you responding? 
I mean, I, I think that, you know, sellers have life events which often dictate their desire to sell or not. Um, and, you know, what's going on in the market, the political environment, you know, they're, they're hoping that it's going well, but in, in many cases, you know, they're at a point in their lives, their kids are going to college, they don't want to walk upstairs anymore, they're tired of being landlords. Um, so they're making that decision, I think, you know, with some input on what's going on in the marketplace, but also, you know, to a large extent based on what's going on in their personal lives. Um, I do think that, you know, the bigger impact is, is, is on the buy side. Um, you know, to Fred's point, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, Fred spoke specifically about, you know, what are the implications of the taxes and, and how is this going to affect my bottom line and how am I being treated as a pastor or not. And I do think that that gives um, buyers some pause and that's something that they're, they're trying to work through right now. Um, and just on, on a larger level, I do think, you know, with, um, with tariffs and, uh, and, and things going on in the Middle East, and there's just a lot of, uh, it feels to me like there's uncertainty out there in the marketplace from buyers, and they're being very cautious um, in their decision making, um, which is leading to larger, longer uh, sales cycles and your point that you made earlier, uh, smaller transaction volume. So while prices, I think, have held up to a large extent, um, certainly the volume is being affected by I think, all this uncertainty in the marketplace. And you know, in addition to that, I do think there is more inventory in the marketplace. You know, we are townhouse specialists who have been selling large dwellings to to buyers for many years, and you know, while there always were some larger apartments going to some of the Park Avenue Cops or Fifth Avenue Cops or Central Park West, you know, there was a limit to the amount of larger apartment inventory. Now, over the last five years, you've seen a spate of development where the, the developers have seen the shortage of those kinds of units, and um, they have addressed that in their, in their development. So you do see a lot more four or five bedroom uh, apartments out there, which does create some additional competition to our marketplace. Um, you know, I think the carrying costs are, are there that are more onerous. I think in some, in some cases you do have to go through boards. You do have, you know, neighbors and things. And so it, it can be um, a, an asset that people still are not are shifting to from the, their desire to own a townhouse. But it's certainly a factor. And I do think that, you know, while the economy is strong, um, you're also seeing, uh, you know, guys can talk about it better than I, but, you know, there are hedge fund managers. I think there was a time in the last 10 years where, you know, you were making, you know, lots of guys were making hundreds of millions of dollars, but a, a good hedge fund manager can make eight to $10 million a year, and I think that, that they're not making that money anymore. Their, their percentages are being squeezed, their fees are being squeezed, there's more competition out there, so I think that those buyers, while still very affluent, no one's crying, you know, for those guys, they're, they're still, you know, very wealthy people. They're making less than they used to, and while we used to be good for, I don't know, generally think four or five hedge fund deals a year in our office, you know, or six or seven hedge fund deals a year, now we're probably down to two or three. So I think those variables, the amount of inventory, the uncertainty in the marketplace, some of Wall Street not making as, quite as much as they, they may have in the past, and probably also a reduction in the foreign purchasers. Not that townhouses were all those big assets that were purchased by foreigners. Um, but I do think that, you know, you're not seeing a lot of Middle East type Eastern European money, which you used to see uh, in the market, certainly in the, in the, in the, in the period after the financial crisis. Um, that money has dried up. Um, Europe has had a tougher economic uh, outlook over the past years. That's been picking up a little bit now for fewer of those buyers. So from a, from a foreign buyer perspective, I think most of the buyers we're really seeing are primarily from, from Asia, particularly China. You know, I, I think it's interesting because I think as of late, we've actually seen uh, a declining amount of Chinese money coming into New York City. And probably a lot of, quite, quite frankly, a, a, a lessening of Chinese capital overall going into all assets, whether it's condominiums in Vancouver or townhouses or condominiums in New York City or even equity. You know, I touched earlier upon the sale um, to Len Blavatnik of this house on 64th Street, which had 
maybe 12 months before had been bought by HNA Insurance, the Chinese insurance company, and they basically had to sell off their assets. In the case of the house on 64th Street, they made money, but there doesn't seem to be anyone behind them. And right now, there doesn't seem to be anyone uh, behind the hedge funds. And it, and, it, and it does, for the first time, look, as a salesman, I'm always optimistic, the glass is always half full. But it, it's for the first time in about a number of years, I am a little more concerned about where is the next wave of money coming from? And who is the person who's going to spend seven to ten million dollars, which was sort of our average sale over the last, the two prior years, and who actually steps in there? And one of the interesting things that I'm seeing is that people in more traditional businesses, like manufacturing, um, whether it's manufacturing garments, or whether it's manufacturing curtains, or whether it's manufacturing television parts, they're really starting to come to the fore again as Wall Street is fading. I mean, Paul, I don't know if you see it around the office. I mean, are people spending less money? Are people earning less money? And I mean, the, you know, one of the most successful banks in the world? Yeah, people do that. Yes, the answer is yes. People yeah. are earning less money, and, and there's some really specific reasons for that. You know, one, one sort of, you know, cousin of hedge funds is, is just proprietary trading, which is, you know, something that before the financial crisis in 2008, every single bank, you know, well, most banks made frankly, most of their money during the project, basically being hedge funds themselves, and everything else was almost an afterthought. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not that much. And that's gone. Like, you know, banks can't do that anymore since the financial crisis. And um, and that's the, you know, part of the Volcker rule, which, which meant that a lot of these, you know, prop traders who were the highest earners in all these firms, and, and also, you know, followed a lot of the same same strategies that hedge funds followed, those folks just, you know, went away and, you know, got absorbed into the workforce, the market resets down, so right. the answer is the answer is definitely yes, and um, I think there's also you know the, the whole regulatory thing which we haven't really talked about, which impacts everything from frankly how much people are in compensation across lots of industries, not just not just Wall Street, mm -hmm. um, and sort of the focus of the regulators on all sorts of elements of, of banks' performance and compensation even today is, is there, and even you know talking going back to the foreign buyers and you guys are better than I, but. I think it was in, in 16 where the Treasury Department began to, to um, uh, make people yeah. reveal uh, yeah. you know, the, who the beneficiaries the were. Disclosure, right. right. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, frankly, it, it, I've been in wealth management for 25 years, and, and we've always had to know where every single last single came from. Right. But, you know, the fact that that wasn't the case in, in, in big real estate transactions, I think, was a little bit of an anomaly relative to the rest of, of the kind of financial services world. And I don't know if you can trace kind of the downtick a little bit to that period of time, but I have to think that it, it, there are some buyers who were deterred by that. I know there's ways around it, but just the idea that the Treasury Department even cares. You yeah. Know, yeah. You know, I'm an optimist too, and I think, look, if they're keeping bad guys out, that's probably a good thing. I don't mind that that much. But, probably. probably. But, you know, <laughs> probably. But look, there were probably was, were some people that would have bought that $20 million, you know, townhouse that aren't going to because they just don't feel comfortable. And then, you know, a couple other things I'd say is, um, you know, China has obviously put in some pretty significant currency restrictions. So the reason that you've seen, but by the way, Paul, are, are these real? Like, what is that? How, how does that? How does that play out? Does the Chinese government say to you, if you're a Chinese national, look, you know, yeah, you want to what write a check for twenty million dollars? You can't do that. I mean, literally, how does that? How does that happen? They literally don't <coughs> convert the currency to any other you know, hard currency. Okay. So you, you may have you know, billions of Chinese currency, but you can't convert it into any other currency, or at least not at a magnitude that would let you buy anything. So the only people <coughs> that are able to, the Chinese people that are able to you know, buy a townhouse, forget a townhouse, buy you know, a Porsche, are folks <laughs> that had money outside of the country already. And you know, a lot of people did. You know, a lot of the very wealthy Chinese have money in Hong Kong and all over the world, but if you didn't, or didn't have enough, and even if you did have a lot, maybe this isn't the moment that you're going to go and buy that fifty million dollar house because you're not, you don't know if you're going to be able to get money up again. Right. So that's a deterrent even for the wealthiest people. Yeah. Um, and you know, you know, Eastern Europe, Russia has its own you know issues with sanctions. Anyone who's on the sanctions list, um, 
you know, can't get financing, yeah. where basically they want to get financing, they can't get financing, they probably can't get it to a co-op. That's, that's, that's completely off the table. Fred, Fred you know, I, I was just thinking as Paul was speaking just about, you know, 1031 exchanges, you, you, you've now witnessed clients go through these for a number of years now, and they've sort of become a legitimate way or a legitimized way for people to get out of real estate assets that maybe they'd like to sell and move into other things. Are you seeing, is that still a popular tool for people, these 1031s? Oh, yes, and, definitely. And, definitely. Yeah, the, definitely. The, the 1031, actually, in the tax, the new tax law, they removed the 1031 for personal property, but left it for real estate. So, so what does that mean for someone out here who owns a, who owns a townhouse? How can they actually make that happen? Can they still do a 1031 if they live yeah, absolutely. there? Absolutely. Well, if they live there, it, no, because okay. then it's personal use property, so it's got to be converted to rental property, take it into a business, and then do your 1031. And then how long do people need to rent out those properties for? That's the debate. Um, there's no bright line test from the IRS. But most professionals look at it in two years, three years. There's no hard and fast rule. There's no hard and fast rule. Very literally, there's no like you like doesn't the 1031 exchange the, the isn't there a law that says you must rent it out for two years or it says an income producing property? It, but it must be used in a trader business, which the rental property would qualify as. But there's no definition of how long it has to be used in the trader business. And so, are, are you seeing a lot of people doing that still? Not a lot, but we still see a fair number of transactions and people talking about it as, as an option. And, and what else, what other, what other ways are there for people to kind of defer, you know, defer paying taxes on real estate or is the 1031 the only, the only the, way? The 1031 is the primary. I mean, there, there are transactions that can be done with REITs and things like that, but those are very complicated. Craig, can you buy a 1031 through an LLC and lease it back to yourself and, and, and derive the 1031 benefit, or is that not too much? You lost me with that. So, so I, 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 you know, I, I got some money, I sold my apartment, I buy a townhouse, and through an LLC, and I lease it back to the LLC. Right. Is that a legitimate the, the tax? Problem is the, the, the chances are the apartment doesn't qualify. Right, okay, so, I, so that's all, sorry, let's call it an investment property, and then I buy a town, a single family town, multi family property, and I, I want to buy a single family. Can I use that as a temporary rent and lease it through an LLC? Lease it no, back? because again, you're going to be back to it's a really personal okay. use property. I, I, there's a couple of things that I'd say people are doing, um, not on the capital gains side, but as folks probably know, part of tax reform increased the lifetime exclusion that folks are allowed to. to um, have for their estates. So it used to be five five and a half million dollars per person, eleven million more or less per couple. It's basically double that now. So for folks that are at that level of, of net worth, um, <coughs> the ability to transfer assets out of their estate and into their children's or even in some cases their grandchildren's names has um, you know, we now have that much more dry powder to work with. Again, that doesn't apply to everybody, but it definitely applies to some people and real estate happens to be a very powerful tool to use for that because it's easy to claim discounts and all sorts of other things. So we've seen a lot of folks do that. Again, it's not capital gains deferral, but then the state taxes, frankly, are much more insidious than capital gains. And so, so Paul, literally, so it's $22 million per couple? Per couple? Yeah. Wow. So so let's say you use, you've already used your 11, you know, and, and, and now you, know, you woke up on January 1st and you had another 11 to play with. You know, what do you do? find yourself in an environment where maybe real estate prices have come down a bit, right? right? Your home, your commercial property, whatever it is, you can you can claim the liquidity discounts, you can do sort of some other things with partnerships, and you can transfer maybe, you know, five million dollars worth of real estate and it might only cost you three million dollars of estate tax exclusion. That's really powerful. Right, that's significant. Yeah. It really is. Um, I, I, I'm just thinking, so are, are, does anyone out there have, I, I want to open this up for questions from the floor. So is that the ratio, three to five? 
No, not necessarily. No, no. It, it can't be. It depends on how aggressive you want to be. You know, it completely depends again on how aggressive you want to be and the nature of the property and how liquid it is. And, you know, how, how do you determine that? You, you know? have to get an appraisal and you, 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 you and then you also have to see how it's, the ownership is structured because if there are minority interests, those can be discounted more than if you just own it yourself and control the whole thing. So there's nuances to it. But, you know, three to five, I mean, if you could get something that's worth five down to three, that would be kind of a victory. That would be a big discount. No, we, we just did a transaction where the client was giving away 15% of an interest in the property, and we got a 35% discount from the appraiser. But that's on a per property basis, right? You'll, right? It's not it's not 15%, or rather it's not 35% for divided interest across the board. No. It's determined on an individual <coughs> transaction. But I would argue if you have a townhouse, which is a more esoteric, Less liquid market than a two bedroom condo, you probably can get a better yeah. appraisal than You'll get a better appraisal on yeah. the real estate aspect. Okay. Yep. Um, when Paula mentioned the 22 million for uh, pass through on state tax for federal, uh, what has New York State or New Jersey went to? New Jersey's easy at this point. New Jersey has no state tax. Has an inheritance tax which applies if if the assets are going to other than their most family members. Um, New York is a, well, is as high as five point four million, but there's a rollback so that once you go above, you have assets above five point four, you start to roll back and very quickly to a two million exclusion, and that. That is a factor that we're hearing more and more from people about. Gee, New York is very expensive from the state tax point of view. And what is the percentage of tax? Uh, 16% is the top rate. And again, it's not, I don't remember the exact rate point, but it's not a very big estate that gets you to a 16% bracket. Right. Yep. Uh, but I see any of the proposed, the state's proposed, New York state's proposed bypasses, such as switching from <clears throat> payroll tax having any appreciable success and impact on you know dealing with the, you know, the tax limitations or the deduction the duck, the duck, the duck. it's why we were, we were talking about it earlier I, I think that we need more than New York State to do it um, as an example we use ADP for our employees ADP can't tell us what they're doing about the payroll tax yet <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, what percent of 1031 exchanges get audited, and what is the result of the use of the votes? That's a good question. <laughs> good question. <laughs> I don't know that that's published. You <laughs> do it, so what's your sense? The, the number of audits today are so small that I would guess that probably 5 to 10 percent is the maximum. So you would encourage people to cheat on their taxes for them? Are those where no sense of what gets just I actually think that's a, that, that's interesting that now only five you have a five percent on rate and it's and it's greatest. Like again, within the realm of high net worth individuals, on a, in a typical year at its greatest worth 30% of, of returns getting audited? Or what, I mean, what, what was the high point of audits? I, I would say probably in our clients, I don't think more than 10% was. Was, it, was that broad? That's a, that's a pretty good reason that's to both cheat. Both, that's pretty good. That's both <laughs> corporate and. Yeah, but that means you're going to get audited once every 10 years, right? Oh, are they? It's every, it's, so, so once you're audited, no, it's, it's no, time. Oh, I see. I see. Yes. That's, 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 it's the unusual transactions that will trigger. But that's come down. You're saying under the current administration. Well, even before that, I mean, it's, been, it's, it's been a decline. Mr. Ross. I was just going to say, if you do something reasonable, the odds of getting ordered are very low. But if you do something absurdly ridiculous, you know, in terms of you know your creative thought process. You're opening going yourself up. It's not a percentage of things randomly being ordered. There's things that look odd that right. invite the audit. Exactly. Well, we, yes, Mr. Lesson. 
just wanted to change course a little, Rick. Can you talk about, you know, similar to the financial markets, we've, did, we've adopted a bid ask spread. Um, it appears in the last month or two that that spread has uh, gotten smaller. So, what does that mean uh, ultimately for the owner, for the broker, et cetera? And, and Rick, could you define for people what the bid ask spread is? Yeah, so, I mean, if we are. We've started to do this on the Upper West Side, where I do a lot of my business, and we are expanding into the rest of the office. Um, we've been doing this for about the last year. The bid ask spread is basically the, the spread, the, the percentage differential between the asking price and the ultimate sales price. So, um, what we what we've been seeing on the Upper West Side is uh, through much of last year, uh, we were seeing the bid ask spread started sort of in the low 20s, maybe 23, 24 percent made its way up as high as 28%. And more recently, um, we are seeing that spread compressed to about a 20% spread. And I, you know, to a large extent, I think that is uh, a result of, of, of lower prices on the, on the ask, not on the bid side. So it's not like sales prices are going up so much that it's, it's closing that gap. It really is um, asking prices have gotten very frothy. You know, we had a a nice run through 2014 through 2015, and I think seller expectations were high. And we've talked about a lot of the variables that have contributed maybe to to uh, shifting the, the dynamic a little bit more to a buyer's market. And I and I think while prices are still, from a historical perspective, pretty high, um, <coughs> there have been price drops, and so we are seeing that that compression uh, occur, and hopefully, as, as the bid ask spread narrows, this problem we are seeing with transaction volume will get reversed and we'll start seeing uptick in transactions. So you're, it's correlated, you're, are you seeing more uptick in showings as the spread? Um, I would say that uh, so far, at least I think on the Upper West Side, we haven't seen a, a big uptick in showings. I do think there's been a more active market. Certainly, we've seen some very large transactions. Just spoke to the uh, the 90 million transaction. There's been some 40 million dollar transactions on the 70s off, off between Fifth and Madison. Um, there has been an increase in uh, some larger transactions downtown. Uh, but that being said, you know, right now as we are entering the second month of the second quarter, um, the number of contracts signed have increased. So. It'll be interesting to see where those ultimate sales prices come out to, and how that will, you know, how that compares to the bid ask spread. Is. Yeah. What discount do you folks see for townhouses versus a big new luxury apartment building with all the amenities, moving conditions, the, the pool, the exercise room, the dog walking, the services? These are older properties. I think you threw out the twelve hundred dollars a foot or fifteen. What's what's the premium above that because of all that product and all? I mean the the asking prices for these new luxury condos tend to be a good deal <coughs> higher than what you see townhouses typically sell for. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. I think partly um, if you have a simplex, a one floor, you know, apartment. Probably a little more efficient in terms of space usage than the townhouse, which has, you know, stairs and elevators. Fun factory all in it. <clears throat> so certainly, I mean, um, right now, you probably depending on the neighborhood in the Upper West Side, you're probably seeing things more in the thirteen hundred dollar range. In downtown, in the village, you probably see you may see things as high as two or three thousand dollar range, the occasional four thousand um, dollar sale. But I think the new condos, you're certainly it's not uncommon to see asking prices in the, in the three thousand dollars a foot um, and certainly for penthouses and things like that you're seeing things at seven eight nine ten thousand dollars well that's pretty huge there, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's interesting because not only are you paying more per foot but the, the carry costs are also a lot higher so i think that is still a distinct advantage for our market is you really do, do get a lot more back from the buy. that's a good point yeah and I, I think it's something that all of us in the office really try and stress because it, it, uh, on the one hand, it's a blatantly obvious discrepancy, right? You're paying a vast upcharge for these new condominiums, and there truly is value in the townhouse properties. There continues to be as well. 
a real value from a tax perspective in that while every single person here is unhappy about their most recent tax bill, on a price per square foot basis, there's still a solid 30 to 35 percent underneath what condominiums are paying. And I would add also, you can track the modern listings today with the click of a mouse, and with finding townhouse prices in different neighborhoods is trickier. So again, I guess if I'm a seller, um, that's to my advantage because I look, look at all these other numbers and they're easy to find. And if, if I have a more of an imperfect market, if you will, I can convince you that I'll give you a bigger bargain. I mean, I, I, I think that's true, but in the conversation I so frequently have with owners is, you know, people have, have a perceived sense of value of what the real estate is worth. And I truly have this conversation on a daily basis. But the reality is, having nothing to do with asking prices, real estate sells in a range. And barring a death or divorce, which I'll be in some of our business, townhouse properties sell within five to seven and a half percent of whatever the most recent trade was. It is very, very rare to find any kind of anomaly when you look at things. That said, people are always, you know, owners are always under the impression that perhaps their property is worth X amount more. And what we found is that's simply not the case. Well, what I was trying to say is there are this many sales of townhouses versus this many sales oh, yeah. of the other. Yes. So, yes, I understand the 5% to 7%, but the last sale might have been a year and a half ago. Yeah, that's true. That, that's very true. That's very true. Well, well someone means... tells me it's a year and a half ago, I say, let's start over. Yeah, yeah that's true. The, the volume is much lower. Any other questions? Following up on that, is, is there a generational divide between the people that are looking for the townhouse versus the apartment with the wine cellar and the gym and all the other fancy amenities? Because from our point of view, my wife and I, we look, you know, we're not drawn to all the fancy, you know, appliances and all the features apartment, we're looking for the space and the layout and everything else. Well, I mean, I, I, I think you, you touch on something that comes up on a regular basis and something that Rick actually was discussing a little bit earlier, which is that real estate developers have gotten a lot smarter over time. They used to build these one-bedroom studios, two-bedroom apartments. With the rise of these four- and five-bedroom condominium apartments, it really does provide an alternative for families. You know, if someone said to you, look, you can either be in this four and five or five bedroom apartment building with full services, and, and I understand it doesn't matter to you, but for the most part, it makes life easier. All of us who own townhouses, you've dealt with the roof, you've dealt with the plumber, you've dealt with problems with the toilet, You've, tell, you've dealt with leaky rooms. And the fact that you can get rid of all of that and pay a little bit of a premium is absolutely impacting our market. It really is. And I think that what the townhouse market has that a lot of this new construction does not have is the discount. Right now, it's the economics of living in a townhouse that are the most compelling reason for I think that really does make a difference to a lot of people. Um, I also just think, you know, the, the city has changed from the time that I was growing up. I mean, the go-to place used to be the Upper East Side. You had five or six great private schools there. You had access to Central Park. The Upper West Side was end. Then the Upper West Side filled in. That became popular. Now, Greenwich Village, East Village, West Village is much more popular. Chelsea, now that Avenue Schools is there, has also become much more popular. I mean, these are all things that play into people's decisions. 
And quality of schools, quality of life makes a big difference. Robbie Conta, who services Brooklyn Heights in our office, has seen a boom in business because Brooklyn Heights is the way New York City was 20 years ago, or rather Manhattan was 20 years ago. And it does, it makes a big difference. It all plays into that. Anyway, if anyone else has no more questions, which is totally fine, have more drinks, chat, talk to these guys. Oh, another question? Okay, I want to thank the panel. I want to thank you for the wonderful presentation. My question is, we're witnessing a higher rate of single-family townhouses that have been furnished in one family on the market. And the question is, why is that? There are no buyers in the market? Right. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, certainly from a seller's perspective, the simple answer is the single family buyer will pay more. So if you're an owner and you want to sell your asset, um, if you're selling a multifamily, you're, you know, the buyer is looking at what kind of return on my money am I getting? I've got to look at what's my capital, what's my rent roll multiple. Um, so when you, if you take a, take a five million dollar house, it's got a a, I don't know, a 10 percent return, which would be a very high return. I mean, what is it? That's uh, fifty thousand, five hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, and you know, you, you, you play it out, and, and it just, on its price per square foot, it will inevitably result in a much lower price per square foot than if you were to sell it to a single family buyer who really wants the who wants the real estate, who wants the neighborhood, who wants the location, who's not looking for investment barrier. So there's no question. That that is what is what drives the, the gentrification from multifamily to single family, and it really is quite actually it's just returned to the way it was. Most of these townhouses were built as single family homes. Then I think in the depression years they became multifamilies, and now you know as people are more affluent and can afford to live in these large spaces. Market, what I think is that they all hit the down market. You're going to find that. In the down market, that's what happens. In the up market, the user always pay more. In my neighborhood, people buy multifamily and turn into single family. So I think it's all a matter of the different markets that are going to go down. And I don't think there's too many people that's room for things to go down. Anyone? Anyone? No? Brian? Uh, question for you. And, and again, I'll echo the thanks to the panel and, and Jen and all for our organizing this. Question for you as you're speaking with your sellers at times is unused transferable development rights coming into your evaluation of the properties with any increasing frequency? That's actually a really good question. And it's so, and by the way, that was not planned. That, that's a real question. <laughs> the, um, uh, it's, it actually has, it's, it, it's come up with, with a surprising amount of frequency over the last six months. And while on the one hand I feel like, oh my god, the market's going to hell in a handbasket, nothing's ever going to be good again, all of a sudden, at the same time, you are seeing developers doing assemblages. And anytime developers are doing assemblages, that's both a sign that the market has probably reached the bottom, and B, a sign that your air rights once again have value. And certainly on the Upper East Side, we're working on a transaction right now where, where we are selling air, which I always find amazing, for $600 a foot. I mean, it doesn't exist. And people are paying $600 a foot for it. And it's really extraordinary. And I think the rezoning of Midtown has made a huge difference as it relates to air rights. I think J.P. Morgan Chase's decision to build a, what is going to be a massive office building on 48th Street, I think, 47th or 48th Street, is also going to play a huge role because all of the air rights that are available in Midtown are going to get bought up, either by existing office building owners or by developers, and by default, that's going to spread north, and it's going to spread south, and it's going to spread east and west. So yeah, air rights are definitely coming back into a play in a way that I haven't seen in probably 10 years. It is more, it's more of an avenue phenomenon. I mean, you do have, as you know, you know, restrictions on what you can do on the side streets, and landmarks, and sliver laws, and things like that. So, so the bigger plays and the assemblages typically do 
occur either on the, on the avenues or within 100 feet of the avenues. Yeah. Yeah. That Midtown zoning is allowing it to be like you sell it to anyone. It doesn't have to be to anyone. Yeah, that's actually, you, you touched on a very interesting point. So traditionally, air rights you could typically sell to a contiguous property or you could arrange a easement over an existing property where you can transfer air rights from a building down the block and move them over to your site. And what the new rezoning has done is basically allowed you to take air rights that are on 51st Street and move them to 44th Street without any penalty. And it's really been, it's actually very smart from an economic development perspective. And it really will add to uh, the growth of Midtown, particularly East. I, I, I do think that's an interesting topic, which is the development of Midtown West and Hudson Yards, and everybody was running over there. And I think that now that this rezoning has been passed, it's really going to serve as an impetus for builders and corporations to both stay and relocate into Midtown. But uh, another thing that has changed values as well this rezoning is the second avenue subway. If you're, if you're farther east on the upper west, upper east side, that used to be one of the more affordable places to buy real estate. And you know, it's not happening overnight, but you are definitely seeing an increase in values over there because it's just much easier to get over there than it used to be. So. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, we are gonna let people go. Paul, do you have any sort of final thoughts? You, you don't have to, but I'm not putting on the spot. Uh, no, the, the only other thing I guess we haven't mentioned that's probably worth mentioning is that you know interest rates are going up in case anyone. Oh yeah, good, good or bad. <laughs> interest rate, interest rates rising, good which, or bad. Which you know <laughs> also you know matters. It matters to asset prices, real estate, and otherwise. And you know I think that's you know look, we all prefer for them to stay low, but the fact they're going up sort of reflects again this sort of healthier economy and, and a bunch of good things. Um, and you know I think the market even today the stock market sort of have a little hiccup because it didn't like the level that the tenure got to. And you know, then a couple of days later, the market will have forgotten and then we'll reset the next level. <laughs> and it's just the way it's, it's incredible, like you know, how short people's memories are. And, and you know, we have to remember that we've been in this 10 plus year period of these abnormally low rates and we're resetting even now to rates that are still historically really low. And, um, but that's going to change math, literally, for everything for cap rates for financing for, you know, all the stuff which, short term probably isn't positive it's not positive for any market but right. really over time that that kind of gets absorbed and you know we've all operated in higher interest rate environments than we're today it's been okay so I think that's part of a little bit of the maybe the ailment that you know, some markets are feeling right now. I think that's true. Fred do you have any other sort of thoughts or do you don't have to? No. <laughs> all right good you're all free to go. Class is dismissed. Thank you.